Hey, how you doing? Hey, what's going on, man? Not much. Thanks for doing this with me. Of course, of course, it's been a long time coming. Yeah. So, are you are you training any uh, doing any training sessions with players for Team USA? Uh, just with Zach. I was working with Zach for a couple weeks uh, while he was out while he was in town, and I uh, actually worked with the majority of the Australia guys more so than in the U.S. guys. That's cool. Yeah. All right, so uh, I'm gonna I've got a list of questions. If you're okay with doing those, let's get rocking. What are the challenges you face every day when training clients? Uh, not getting too consumed with um, just outside influence, like knowing and understanding, you know, what kind of makes my business tick and, and makes me tick as a trainer. Uh, my players game, like it's really easy to get consumed with what's going on on social media and you know, hearing uh, little things or seeing little things where it could sway you, sway your training style, sway your, your thought process a little bit, but it's all, a lot of it's just being, staying true to yourself and, and your intelligence uh, and on the topics of, of skills training. And then, um, you know, making sure that you have an open dialogue with, with your clients. Yeah. So uh, like, what were the uh, little things from like social media that would like change your training? Oh, when I first when I first was getting my feet established, like getting myself established as a trainer, like social media was was booming, and there'd be trainers from all over the map. They would post stuff like on like skills, skill work, drills, and stuff, and it made me think like, oh man, I must not be doing something correctly. And then there was people that were just bashing like the way that certain trainers, like myself, train, um, and like that gets you to question, you know, what it is that we're as you're actually doing so a lot of that is just that undue influence that you get across social media that might sway you otherwise because you get some people who you can only see like social media only allows you to see you know the 10 percent of what they're actually doing you know that 90 percent of the context is lost in translation so uh making sure that you know you just stay true to yourself and and i've done enough research on on how to operate um yeah. And I've had enough uh, enough failures in my past uh, with skills training to to know what works and what doesn't, and yeah. kind of what sticks. Yeah, that's cool. So, uh, what advice would you give me if I wanted to become a basketball skills trainer when I got a little bit older? Uh, I, first off, do it. Um, it's probably one of the most reward. It's it's like teaching, you know, like it is. We are glor glorified teachers in the sport, and uh, there's nothing more rewarding than actually seeing your client, your customer benefit from tutelage and, and, and grow and learn. It's like they're making a test when they have a good game. And, uh, like that stuff is, it, it holds intrinsic value. Um, and uh, I'd say probably one of the best, like, uh, experiences. One of the best, best experience, but one of the best, uh, best things that I can, you know, do to kind of sway you that, in that direction. And pushing that, pushing that direction is, is, you know, making sure that, you know, you understand the freedom and flexibility that comes with being a skills trainer. Like for me, like I, I enjoy not having the same, same schedule and not, I enjoy my boss, um, and being able to work for myself and, and not having to deal with, you know, somebody else that I have to call to. And, um, I really, really, it, it's really important for me to have family time. So, um, being a skills trainer allows me to do that. Like I control my own schedule. I make sure to, to do all these things, which I'm sure as you're noticing in your young, your early young life, like doing these podcasts, like, yeah, you're at the whim kind of like your client or the people that you're interviewing, but there's going to come a point after you, you know, log the hours that you're continuing to log and uh, you've excelled at, you know, kind of perfecting your craft that you realize that people conform to your schedule, um, which makes it a, just huge, huge thing. And don't get me wrong. Like there were a lot of, there were a few years where I was grinding till 10 o'clock and, and the hours weren't, you know, weren't the best, but I did so, so that way I could be at this position. And like, that's what I was looking at, looking forward toward, um, when I first started out as being a trainer. 
That's cool. So uh, you said family time is big with you. So like, how does that impact your business? Do you like not do training up into certain hours just because like you need family time? Yeah. So I stop at five uh, and then I don't work on the weekends. That's so really good. I'm sure yeah. that it's a lot of stress, especially. Yeah, oh my gosh. Yeah. Leave it at the gym. Yeah, it's nice. So how long have you been a trainer? Um, Unprofit, like not professionally, been a trainer since uh, my junior year of high school, or junior year of college. I started with my first client, and we had uh, just came into the gym while I was working. Um, I was working at the gym, like checking people in, and um, lady came up, was like, "Hey, you know, I got a daughter. Do you guys offer basketball training?" I told her no, but I'm on the team, so I might as well give it a shot. And um, I was very monochronic. I did, you know, broke things down like five minute increments, like do this drill for five minutes, get a water break for a minute and a half. And like function kind of like a basketball coach, which two different, like two different areas of, of expertise. And um, ever since then, it's just kind of like, I've always had these, you know, a couple of clients here and there. Um, and it wasn't until probably about 2013 when I got done playing 2012, when I got done playing professionally, that I started getting into it and dabbling a little bit more um, heavily into training and then turned it into a profession in 2014, 2015, uh -huh. um, where I was able to make it into a career. How long did it take for you to get some more, so, some actual like NBA players and pro players? Ooh, uh, probably later, about a three year foundation on just remedial basketball. Um, very basic level basketball before I started getting any NBA clout. And, uh, my first clients were Jamal Franklin from San Diego State. Um, and then Al Harrington, Wilson Chandler. Those are my first like three uh, big, big clients. And from there, just kind of like kept on building. And I wouldn't say that that's, you know, the one market that I've always tried to try to get. Like I've, I've been more like for, for a lot of people that don't see it um, or don't understand the landscape of, of basketball training, like the money is solid for the NBA level, but as a trainer, you know, working with my business model, that's not, you know, where you're going to generate, you know, all your revenue it's seasonal, unless you're a consulting firm or you're a basketball trainer who consults for their NBA clients, which I'm not, um, in the, the amateur clientele is definitely where you make, you know, the money. Yeah. So how many, uh, how many clients do you have as of right now? Oh, um, we're kind of like a revolving door. So we have, you know, these things with these, these positions called transformation clients. Yeah. Um, people travel from all over the world, um, throughout the U S across borders. So you just train with us for shorter periods of time. So we have like one kid who's going to be with us for a month and a half from Lebanon, uh, this woman from China, a 34 year old from China. Uh, we had a girl from Taiwan who's with us for the week. Last week we had uh, a kid from Northern California, a kid from the East coast. And it's just like, we just get grab bags of, of players. Um, those are typically that's like where my business model, like is the, it's the heart of my business model, like what I love to do, but yeah. on a recurring schedule, we probably have like anywhere from 60 to 70 not like i'd say about 40 to 70 clients that are on a daily basis coming through the gym oh, wow. um and that'll be the turnover on that is you know probably say about a couple hundred a week yeah so what are the basic things you would teach every single every player so uh foundational stuff like i'm I'm all about athletic fundamentals. Yeah. So keeping the game simplistic, uh, giving a very efficient understanding game cuts, angles, reads, uh, but then understanding how to control your body in the process. So footwork, foundational stuff is really important. Yeah, that's a big thing when I'm playing basketball. Like when I'm trying to like get footwork right, it's just, it's a mess for me, but <laughs> I see a lot of other people are perfecting it. So I'm trying to get there. Yeah. So, um, what is the key aspect to your business that most people probably wouldn't think of? Uh, that I've made it 
uh, I've made a career out of turning, uh, being about the trans, the transformation, not about the transaction. Um, a lot of people see success or they see somebody who might be attaining success and, you know, success is such a an ambiguous term. Um, for one person it could be just having, making sure that their, their clients are successful. That's what makes them successful for another it's financial means. Um, for me, like I've always been generate, I've always generated my business off of making sure that I kept it at the forefront of my mentality and kept, kept to the forefront of my model to be about the transformation and the relationship that I can establish with each client, not about the dollar gain dollar ad from, from each client that gets, that comes to our gym. So, uh, players that can be in the gym, players that get in the gym with us, they notice it, uh, just from the energy that we have and, and the relationships and level of comfort that we can make people feel when they get, get into our, get onto our heart with, uh, but that's something that unless you're there, like in person, it's, it's hard to, to put a real, real pin on. Yeah. It's, it's the, the personal level is way better than just like, I only like you cause you're paying me. It's, yeah way better so how do you manage your time with all the stuff you're doing you've got tons of uh people that you're training and then you got family time and all that other stuff pray <laughs> <laughs> a lot of prayer uh, no it's 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 actually like during now during summer it's actually really frustrating because there's so much stuff yeah like over like turn like turn over turn over this is happening uh alex caruso just started zach Levine just left Aussie team was in here for 10 days. Um, we'll have Julius Randall that might pop, he might pop in in a couple of weeks. We have uh, like just, it's just a grab bag of like NBA guys who will be in town and then they won't be in town. And then pros that have come over for a couple of weeks. I got a couple of pros in Turkey that are out here for three weeks and they leave this at the end of this week. And then we got more pros coming in from Italy and it's just like, it's nonstop. So, yeah. Uh, making sure that I just keep my head on straight and allocate like a certain uh, certain time throughout the day to to cross reference and check like what my schedule is for the next forty eight hours, yeah. so I can make sure everything's in line. Yeah, schedule maintaining is really hard, especially with your schedule yeah. probably. So um, to switch the topic up a little bit here, what was your time like when you were playing pro ball? Uh, it sucked. Uh, really, I, I love I love basketball. And I thought, you know, like I didn't think that uh, that I was going to be able to like play at the professional level at all. And I never thought of basketball as like something as a career choice. I thought it was just going to be a means to a, you know get a good education at UC San Diego. And um, I got the opportunity. I had a really good collegiate career, so I had the opportunity to play professionally. And I went over to New Zealand and Mexico and. Um, it just took a little bit out of it. I wasn't able to play, you know, with my family there watching the games. Like when we play in New Zealand, it would be like 3 a.m., like really late. So nobody's able to watch me on even online. Um, and it, I was playing for a paycheck. So it turned into a job and like it never was that for me. It was always just an escape and, you know, a release and a great, you know, form of exercise and so, a sport that I love to play. So um, it definitely, definitely didn't resonate as well with me. And it's, it's a grind overseas is a grind. People don't realize that they think it's just like, Oh, you get a contract. Like you're good for the year. Like, no overseas basketball. If you don't perform like for a weekend, like though you're on the chopping block to get cut. So like you're constantly looking over your shoulder and making sure, hoping that, you know, you don't get released, you know, from this program. Um, so there was a lot that, you know, I, I didn't care for now granted it was a tremendous experience and you know I was able to travel and there's a lot that I'm thankful for and blessed that I was able to do but um, I would much rather have my career that I'm that I have currently than play professional basketball again yeah a lot of players think of it as a uh, kind of just like you just get in and then it's just all uphill from there it's yeah. kind of interesting that you found it that way so um why did you decide to start a YouTube channel Crap, I think I started it like eight years ago, like really like a long, long time ago, but never really did well with it. I got a couple of videos that did okay, but for the most part, like 
wasn't until COVID where I was able to actually gain some traction. Yeah, that's cool. I started watching your videos right around COVID. And I was like, hey, this dude would be great to interview. So oh, nice. <laughs> so when you had your uh, brain tumor, do you think you would ever be able to like live life you're living now after you had that? Uh, honestly, I, I didn't know. Um, there was just so many questions and so many variables, like something that's extremely fresh and new. And I had no idea what acoustic neuroma was. And then, you know, like flash forward, you know, three months and then I have surgery and it's like, okay, well, I don't really know what to expect. And I'm more of like a liquid type person where I'll just go with the flow on anything. Yeah. Uh, and I knew I was going to be deaf. Um, I knew I was going to have like balance issues. I knew there was going to be a lot of these, you know, deficits, but I didn't think, you know, I didn't think it would restrict me enough to like actually worry about it. Yeah. So like I went into it, you know, laughing and not laughing, but I went into it like just excited for what, you know, this new process and new beginnings it was going to be like while not taking for granted, like what that I've been blessed with for, you know, 32 years of my life leading up to it. So, um, yeah, looking, looking back though, like I still have moments where it's like, man, like, I still feel like I'm drunk 24 seven or feel like I'm on a boat like 24 seven because of my lack of vestibular like balance, uh, cause where the tumor was pushing on, I still have tinnitus in my ear. So it's like constant ringing, um, I'm deaf in the right ear completely. So there's a lot of things where, I'll stop like every day and be like, dang, I guess sucks. I can't like move or I feel my balance off or I hear my ringing again. And I just kind of brings me back to reality, but um, still a blessing that I'm able to live a full life and be able to live as for my normal. Yeah. How do you stay so so positive even when things are going badly, like COVID and everything else, you just seem so happy during all that. Yeah. I I think I I just have, have my faith to lean on a ton. Um, you know, I, I feel like there's a bigger purpose in this world than just the immediate things that we have, immediate events that we have to deal with on a daily basis. And, um, you know, that purpose is just to bring the purpose for me is to make sure that people can see, you know, the Lord's light, like shining through me. And, you know, like I have so much to be thankful for on a daily basis. You know, I have so much to, uh, so much to just, you know, count. I have so many blessings to count every day with my family, with my health. Uh, so why not express that? And, you know, there may be some, be some people that, you know, get put off by it, but the same, uh, the same breath, like, like I absolutely love, you know, my life. And, and if I can just shed a little bit of light to, you know, to others um, who may be going through a tough time and, you know, maybe see, you know, what I had to endure and, you know, look at it as like, man, this guy had to go through a little bit and he still has a positive outlook, then, you know, then maybe I can sway them and help them, you know, get through stuff. Hey guys, thanks for watching. Make sure to leave a like and subscribe. Also, comment below who you think I should interview next time. And I'll see you next time on What I Want to Be.